Hey, and welcome to Winning Conversations. We are glad that you are back with us again this week. We're going to continue our conversation with Trey and Heather Johnson. If you didn't get a chance to listen to last week's, I want you to go back and listen to Heather's story. We really kind of ended up focusing mainly on her story last week. And this week, we're going to talk about how God brought them together, uh, Trey's story and his experience in the pro rodeo world and in ministry, and some of the cool things that God has brought them through. So without further ado, let's jump into part two. You know, the anointing that's on her life, and it's, you know, the Lord allows us to cross a lot of denominational barriers. So we're in every different type of denomination, and it's so cool to see because what God's done in her is so real and so powerful, it's like they forget that they're Methodist or Baptist or yeah. Pentecostal or Church of God or Assemblies of God, whatever it is, and it and it and the anointing is just penetrating those women where they're at and seeing them get free and and just seeing, you know, where Heather's at now is just phenomenal, you know, and I know it's just a tip of the iceberg for what God is doing and what he's going to do with her. And I take it very serious, my responsibility to help her get there, to create that environment for her to know God and develop her gift and develop her calling and to flourish and thrive. And she's a warrior, that's for sure. I believe that. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> it's an honor to really truly be a friend of yours. Oh, because thank of you. Seeing God in you. It's awesome. Thanks. Speaking of your story, Trey, mm-hmm. Oh, we haven't even touched it yet. No. And uh, um, I don't know if you've seen my little son running around with his cowboy hat on Sunday, <laughs> but he's 12 and he's sure he's going to grow up and just be a cowboy. He's like, all right. He's like, this is what I'm going to do. So I told him today that I was going to talk to you. And so he wanted me to find out what your story was oh, with cool. rodeo and things like that. So <laughs> yeah. I know God is in the middle of all that. So will you yeah. just jump in to, you know, sure. Um, stuff? You know, that's what I grew up doing. You know, whenever uh, I was a little baby, well, when I was born, my toes touched my heels on both feet. And so I was never supposed to wear boots or walk, you know, run. I was supposed to walk and everything. But they'd have to go in and break all the bones in my feet and reset the bones in my feet. Like club foot? Yeah, like real severe case. Instead of it being in, they were turned under where they oh. touched my heels. And so they'd have to break all the bones and straighten them out. Um, and so my dad, you know, when he worked on a ranch when I was little, he, had, he padded a five gallon bucket with pillows and stuck me in the bucket and attached it to the saddle horn while he's riding across the path. I wouldn't recommend that, you know, <laughs> but, so <laughs> I mean, funny, yeah. but that's just, I mean, I grew up doing it, you know, I mean, right. as a little kid, I remember sitting in my wheelchair after all surgeries and everything in the barn, there's horses running around and dogs jumping on me and, you know, and so I just grew up, you know, I think I, I, uh, I was, broke my first horse when I was five and that's just, what does break my, to, yeah, what does that mean? Trained yeah. like a horse that it had never been messed with. Of course, my dad didn't help me catch it, but like um, wasn't trained to ride or anything like that. So, it, but I mean, it was just, and so I got to guide it through its process of training it where to how to turn left and turn right. And, you at know, five? at five years old. Yeah. And, <laughs> but it's just, it's a way of life, you know? And, and so I grew up doing that, you know, riding, cutting horses and stuff with my granddad. I grew up with my granddad, you know, I'd go to, spend all day with him working cows and he wouldn't stop for lunch because he just worked through lunch mm-hmm. uh, and it's been a great way of life growing up you know because I mean my mom and dad was out there helping us practice and rope and I have an older sister and uh, she rode and everything and so we would that's how we spent our time you know and I didn't realize how much confidence just as a person right. that was instilling into me mm-hmm. all the all night drives and stuff with me and my sister in the back seat of sleeping and mom and dad up there driving um, and the great memories, you know, driving across the country and rodeoing and sleeping here and sleeping there, you know, and, and, uh, but, and so, so my parents, they took me to church, you know, we went to church some and, you know, they, they loved God and they took us to a Baptist church. And so I knew that I needed Jesus in my life. And when I went to college, I got connected with the wrong people and the drinking and the drugs and all that type of stuff. And I started dating this girl from El Paso and I quit college and I thought I was going to marry this girl. And, um, that's what mom and dad said, Trey, you know, we're, we love you, but we're not going to finance the decisions that you're making. I was like, well, that's fine. You know, I'll just, I'll get it figured out, you know, and, 
And I went home one weekend because uh, they said, you're always welcome here, but we're not going to finance what you're doing. And so I went home and um, I was leaving to go back to El Paso. And when I was leaving to go back, my dad come running out the back door and tears just running down his face. And he says, Trey, the Lord, show me you're going to die if you don't get your life right. And I was like, yeah, all right, Dad, whatever, you know. And so I go back to El Paso and living this life. About two weeks later, the girl I'm living with at the time is in the back seat asleep. And the guy I'm roping with, he's asleep in the passenger seat. I'm driving a new truck with a horse trailer full of horses. And we're down by Austin, South Texas. And we're going to another rodeo. And it's in the middle of the night. And I'm driving. And I wake up. And I'm running 70 miles an hour down a four-lane highway like this. And so when I wake up, I just tried to ease the truck and trailer back onto the highway, but I saw I wasn't going to make it because there was a big concrete water pillar uh, that runs down the highway there right in front of us. And so it had the concrete slabs going up both sides of the culvert, water culvert. Uh, I got gotcha. you. Okay. And so I pulled the truck back over in the middle, and it hit it perfectly with the truck up the concrete slabs, but the trailer... <laughs> Hit it uh, right on. You know, we're running 70 miles an hour here. And so it, I jumped with the truck, but it just ripped the trailer away from the pickup. And so as we're spinning, you know, around in the pickup, we're coming around. I'm watching that trailer just flip end over end over end. And it has horses full of in horses it. in it. Yeah. Oh and my so gosh. when we, we end up a pretty good ways away from the trailer, when we stop and I realize I'm not dead and the people I'm with are not dead. I just take off running towards the horse trailer because it's just a ball of tin, and you hear the horses, they're pawing oh. and kicking, and and so I couldn't get any of the doors open, uh, and so I found a window that was open, and I crawled through the window, and by this time, people had pulled over and called 911, the, waiting on the jaws of life to come cut the trailer open, but I crawled down in there, and I'm petting the horses, and I'll never forget because there's blood all over the inside of this, and I'm trying to calm the horses down, and I remember my dad. I remember him saying, Trey, the Lord, show me that you're going to die. And, and at that time, even though I didn't know uh, a lot about God, I knew God had nothing to do with the wreck, but I knew that he had everything to do with sparing my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in that trailer, I just called out to the Lord. I'm probably 20 years old at this time, um, and and I just called out to the Lord. And thank God they had taken me to church enough where I knew how to do that. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't anything formal or anything like that. I was just like, Jesus, I want I want to know you. God, I want to know you, you know. And and I made a decision that I I didn't want to know religion. I'd seen people be religious and live a different way, and they would, you know, just I, I didn't want anything to do with that. Right. And, and so I went back. Uh, even though the Lord spared my life, I still went back to that same environment in El Paso, but I made a decision. If I saw something in God's Word, I was going to do it. And so I found Matthew 6, 33, and it was seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else would be added unto you. And I was like, okay, well, seek first I means seek first. So I made a decision when I get up in the morning, that's the first thing I'm doing. I don't care. I'm not doing anything else. And that just started with five minutes. You know, I just put him first and put him first. And then I had a desire, uh, you know, because I'd started rope, you know, I'd rodeo and everything, but I had a desire. I want to be at the top. I want to be one of the best, you know? And, and so I started working at my rope and working at my rope. And in a few months after I'd given my life to the Lord and I'd made this decision, um, I was down at, I went with some friends down to rodeo in South Texas and I'm sitting on the fence cause I wasn't good enough at this time to be in this professional rodeo. So I'm watching and two of the world champions. I mean, they were some of the best and they just ride over to me out of all these people. They had no idea who I was. Of course, I knew who they were. They were one of my heroes, sure. you know, and mm -hmm. they said, Hey, young man, we've got to be in Oklahoma city in the morning by eight o'clock. Uh, would you drive us? And I'm on the inside. I'm thinking, are these guys nuts? They don't even know who I am, you know? And I didn't know how God worked or anything like that. I sure. just, I was like, yeah, no brainer to me. So <laughs> I Great. jumped I'll in the truck. My heroes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I jump in the truck with them, and they're like, "Well, tell us a little bit about yourself." And so I just told them my testimony. I just give my life to the Lord, and one of them, he wasn't even saved at the time, and he says, "Well, why don't you just move to Lano and come to work for me?" I'm like, "Yeah, no brainer, you know." <laughs> so I go back to El Paso, I get my stuff, and I move to Lano, and I don't forget it because when you're in that environment, you don't realize the smoke in your clothes and all that type of stuff. And I get there, and I start bringing my clothes in, and his wife's like, "Whoa, whoa, no, no, you're not bringing those clothes in here. They reek, you know, because <laughs> they had smoke and everything <laughs> yeah. else, you know, just in them." And and so I I went to work for him, and I just 
I just working at my roping, but I just was so hungry for the things of God. I just studying my Bible. He said, man, you're like living with the Pope, you know? And so, <laughs> and, and so I just was putting God first, putting God first. Um, and during this time I get a call and this is just a few months after I'd give my life to the Lord. Well, the people that I lived with, uh, the FBI had come in and busted them with four and a half tons of drugs. And that's a lot of drugs. And so I remember going back and of course, there's a warehouse full of pallets of drugs that they had been, you know, wrapping and sticking in the walls of the trailers and all different type of stuff to haul the drugs. And and so they got, you know, life sentence because come find out they had other sentences in other states. And uh, some of them have died, you know, in prison. Uh, I got to go see wow. two of them in prison, got to lead two of them before the Lord before they died. Um, and then when I got to go back and um, I got to do their funeral. And it was so cool because I knew a lot of the people that were there and their drug right. haulers and drug lords coming from Mexico. And there was probably 30 of them that accepted the Lord, you know, wow. during that service. It was just so cool. That's kind of jumping ahead. But yeah. and so the FBI comes in, bust them in, and the Lord is just revealing to me, see how I spared your life, see how merciful, yeah. you know, what you're you're putting me first. And so during that time, uh, I'm learning. And somehow um, I got a hold of got connected with Dr. Savell. And Brother Copeland, and I remember I'd get their partner letters, and I would just memorize them. You know, I, I'd memorize the scripture, not necessarily the stories, but the scripture. And I started learning how to renew my mind and started learning the importance of declaring the word and learning. And they it just gripped my spirit, man, because it was so different from religion, so different from the things that I'd seen. And I knew I didn't understand it, but I knew that there was something real to it. And I wanted to know how to apply this to my life. Um, and so that was my first encounter with Dr. Savell and Brother Copeland. And, and, and I remember uh, Dr. Savell had this tape cassette that I, that I, and it was called The Winning Attitude. And I devoured The Winning Attitude. I mean, yeah, you know, that was just speaking my language. And so I went back to college, um, went back to Texas Tech, and just I was so hungry. I'd go to class, and then I'd go to the library. And it wasn't to do my schoolwork, but I would just lock myself in a cubicle because I was so hungry for the word. Because during this time, I found, Heather mentioned it earlier, Proverbs 4.20, and it says, my son, pay attention to my words. But a translation, or I don't know if the Lord just spoke to me because it was my language, right. my son be addicted to my word. I was like, well, I know what that's like. Mm -hmm. You know, I that was that. my language. And mm -hmm. so I literally tried to overdose on God's word. And I remember I would just, I mean, I'd have it in the three by five note cards. I'd have it on my dashboard. I'd have, I mean, just everywhere I was at, the word was before me day and night. And he, and he started some of the stuff he delivered me from right away. Other things, it took time. It was a process. But I had this mentality. I'm not quitting. I'm going to go after God and I'm going to know who he is. And How did it affect your relationships within the rodeo and the cowboy world? Because that's not the culture no. of rodeo. Uh -huh. So you're going through this process of renewing your mind yeah. and learning all these things about God. But then you're in the rodeo on the weekend. You know, like yeah. how did that, what did that well, look Well, they like? were waiting for me to go back uh, to the old tray. And I never forget, I'm at college, and I go to this roping in Pecos, Texas, and it's a huge arena, huge parking lot. They're having a rope in there, and it had been a couple of years in the process. And a bunch of my buddies came to me at the rope, and they said, Hey, Trey, would you have church for us tomorrow? And they were, they were you know, wigging out whenever they were asking me that, you know. And, uh, and at first I was like, yeah, you know. And then I got thinking, oh, they're just making fun of me like they had been waiting for me to come back. So I didn't show up the next morning. But when I get to the roping, every one of them came up to me and said, where were you? They had showed up for church, and I didn't, and it crushed me. I mean, it was just like, God, like I had a chance to share with my friends that I knew were going to hell, and I didn't. And I remember I put the truck in neutral and I, in the parking lot, and I just put my head on the wheel, and I said, God, if you ever give me a chance to tell about your goodness, I won't tell you no. And so I go back to school, and I'm on the rodeo team at Texas Tech, and Two weeks later, I'm at um, Big Springs, Texas, at the College Rodeo, Junior Rodeo, and I go up there because at this point, I'm so hungry for things. God, I didn't care if it's Baptist, Catholic. I mean, I just fit said God, and I was I wanting it, you it. know. <laughs> and I go up, and I said, uh, who's who's doing church, you know? Because before I get, got saved, there'd be six, eight people in the stands, and I'd sneak behind it, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, they said, nobody, Trey, would you? And I was like, no. You know, and then I remembered what I just told the Lord. <laughs> like really now yeah, yeah I know <laughs> and I was like okay yeah I'll do it and so hundreds of kids 
which I mean, revival took off in the college rodeo, um, and it's hot chest. Mm. And so I just stayed hungry, um, and at this time, after I did that, you know, of course there are the. I don't know, maybe the second or third time at Texas Tech, they had this big coliseum, and they said they had this big worship night deal, and they said, Trey, would you give your testimony? And I'm like, yeah, okay. And I get up there, and there's thousands of people here. And just on the inside, the Lord says, this is just a glimpse of what I have for you. And I was like, okay, I have no idea what that means, but here we go, you know. And So it got to the point when I was at college that I had so many opportunities. People want me to come and share what God had done and everything that I was, I mean, I'd go to school during the day and then me and a friend of mine, we would drive, he would drive up there and he would do the music and I would preach and then I would drive all night to be back at class. And I was working at my rope and I was the only uh, guy that, you know, at this time I still had the desire to be at the top and learning how God will bless everything you put your hands to and he'll give you the desires of your heart and and, um, and so I'm getting up early and I have a goat and I'm roping the goat and I'm practicing and I'm going to school and I'm preaching. And I mean, I'm just, you know, going right. after what God has for me. And, and, uh, so I make the college national finals, my junior year, my senior year, I was the only kid from Texas tech to make the national finals and the college deal. I was fourth in the nation, um, uh, both years there. And during this time, um, one of the world champions, um, calls me, I'm, I'm at college, I'm roping the goat. He's 16-time world champion at this time. He's an older guy. He says, hey, Trey, I, uh, I want to make the finals in the team roping, and I feel like I'm supposed to rope with you. And I thought it was one of my friends playing a joke on me. So I was like, oh, shut up. Who is this? And he was like, <laughs> no, because I'd never talked to this guy before. And he's like, no, really, this is so-and-so. And, you know, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is really him, you know. And so, and, uh, and so I was like, yeah, for sure. I'll rope with you and everything. And so I went on. I won the rookie of the year. In the professional rodeo um, in 2000, uh, during this time, I had married um, my kid's mom at that time, and I was traveling and ministering. I had a traveling ministry and stuff during that time. I was helping start a few different cowboy churches during that time. I won the Rookie of the Year. And 2001, I'm in Salinas, California at the rodeo, and I'm still putting putting God's for Matthew 6, 33 is how I live my life. I mean, I don't care where I'm at. The Heather and the kids are sleeping. I mean, I'm in the bathroom with the door shut on the toilet. You know, I'm yeah. just, in hotel rooms when it, we're in hotel rooms. Yeah, yeah, in the hotel rooms. And but even you know, I mean, that's just the way I live my life. It's right. real to me. I never set out to be a preacher. I never set out. You know, it's just I want to know God. I want to know how He shows up at the rodeo. How He shows up in business. I I, I just don't want to know Him at church. Yeah, right. And um, and so I'm um, at Salinas, California. I'm spending time with the Lord, and I just have this open eye vision. And the Lord's sitting across the table from me, and He's breaking off pieces of bread, and He'd stick a piece of bread in my mouth. And I'm sitting there chewing, you know, wondering what's going on. He'd stick another piece of bread in my mouth. And then He got up, and out of respect, I got up too. And He put one more piece of bread in my mouth, and He patted me on the back, and He said, Now, Trey, go feed my sheep. I was like, yeah, right, Lord, I'm not a pastor. You know, I'm, and so I'm arguing with the Lord and everything. And so I go back and I knew a a change was coming. I just didn't know because the natural steps, the progression just in the naturals. Okay. You win the rookie of the year, the next, the world championship, then, you know, and so I have these sponsors coming in. I've got the best partners. I'm at the top of the game. And, and so I go, go home and I'm seeking the Lord and the Lord starts showing me the transition coming, and there was a, a guy that pastored a church in Amarillo at this time that when I was in town, you know, I'd go there, and we'd flow in the spirit and stuff together, and uh, and then he did, because I know nothing about rodeo or anything, and he calls, he says, hey, Trey, this so-and-so, uh, would you come by the office? And I was like, yeah, and so I go in and sit down, and uh, he says, I want you to pray about coming on staff and being associate pastor, and I was like, yeah, no. You know, no, yeah, 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 it's not, this is, isn't in my plans here, you know, and my flesh was, cause I'm traveling minister and I had six people work for me at the time, you know, they had, had a lot going on. And, and so I got for the Lord, my spirit, man, I knew it was right, but I was just reading John chapter five when Jesus walks by all the lame people at the pool of Bethesda and he goes to the man that had been in that condition for 38 years. And he says, do you want to be made whole? Because I've been calling out to God, God, I want your perfect will. I don't want just your acceptable will. I, w- I want your perfect will. I- and so wh- I knew he was speaking to me. Do you want to be made whole? You say you want 
what I have for you, but do you really want yeah. what you say you're wanting? And, and, uh, and so I knew that, okay, that's the next step. And the Lord showed me the disciples on the boat when Jesus is walking on the water and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And the Lord says, come. And Peter gets out of the boat and he's walking on the water. And, and the Lord just showed me this, that all the disciples yelling at Peter, Peter, what are you doing? Get back in the boat, you know, because they love Peter. They thought they knew what was best for Peter. That was not, not logical thinking, Peter. Get back in the boat. And the Lord says, this is what's fixing to happen to you. Uh, but you keep your eyes on Jesus. And sure enough, as soon as I to started telling people, okay, I'm, I'm quitting roping, this time uh, I didn't have a lot in resources, but I had great horses. I had a lot of good horses. And I had read at, uh, you know, Song of Solomon when he was 27 years old, how he stepped into this leader position and he gave sacrificial offerings to the Lord. And the Lord shows up and he says, what, what do you want me to do for you? And Solomon says, well, I need wisdom to lead your people coming in, lead your people going out. And the Lord says, well, because you did that, I'm, I'm you know, you're going to have the silver and the gold and everything else. And, and so I, I loaded up my horses because I was like, okay, these are my sacrificial offerings. And I started telling people, okay, I'm quitting rodeo and I'm done. And they're just like, are you crazy? Are you nuts? You've worked your whole life for this. And, and here you are at the top the of the game. Pinnacle. Yeah. I mean, it sounded like, and maybe I, do I understand you yeah. correctly? Like you're on the verge of being world champion, right? Right. Yeah. That's the yeah. next step in the progression of things. You right. know, you're at the top and uh, the sponsors are coming in, you know, all this you work for. Cause it's, it professional rodeo is not like other professional sports. You don't sign a contract and whether you win or lose, you make millions of dollars. No, you've got to be good and you have to win in order to make money, right. the sponsors and all that mm -hmm. type of stuff. And so I was headed in the right direction with that. Well, when I started telling them I was done, they're just like, you're nuts. Well, anyway, so I grabbed my horses and I start driving around the country and giving my horses to certain people the Lord laid upon my heart. And that was my sacrificial offerings. I could have sold them and had hundred plus thousands of dollars, you know, but those are my sacrificial seeds. And that, Lord, I need wisdom for the next steps in my life. And um, so I went on staff, got rid of trucks, trailers, horses. First time in my life, I didn't have a truck, a trailer. I mean, ever since I was a little kid. And, uh, and I said, Lord, if I ever rope again, it, it'll be you. And so I went on staff at the church there in Amarillo. I shut down my traveling ministry because I saw Luke 16, verses 10 through 12, you know, in order to, to have a vision of your own, be faithful to serving another man's vision. And so, okay, I'm all in. You know, God, if this is what you have for me, I'm, I'm willing to do it the rest of my life. And so I got rid of trucks, trailers, you know, sowed stuff as seed and, and uh, went on staff there. And after being associate pastor of that church there, I moved from there to Colorado, uh, where I started a church up there and went through the whole church starting process. We started in a, you know, a, a commercial building and then went to the community center and then found out it was against the law to have a church in that town. And so I went through the whole law changing process. Against the law? Yeah. They, in, in the town's bylaws and everything, you couldn't have a church in the city limits. And so because the cost wow. of living is so high up there, they didn't think that a church could make it up there. And so I'd go to all these city council meetings and just declaring and learning more about the favor of God. And, and when they realized I wasn't just some religious person or, Coming you know, in that yeah. in a built relationship with, they, they rewrote the bylaws and they changed the law. And so I, the Lord opened it up where we had the church right there in the main center of the town. Wow. And, uh, and so got them in a building and stuff. It took about two year process. And I'll forget, I'd been up there, and this guy calls one day. I don't know how he got my number or whatever, and maybe he called the church or something, left a message and said, hey, this is so-and-so. Um, I have an indoor arena up here in Colorado. I hear you're up here. Would you come rope with us? And so I call him back. I'm like, uh, I'm going to have to pray about it. You know, I'll let you know. And so I prayed, and I felt like the Lord was releasing me to go. Pick it up again. Well, just at least a little bit. Yeah. And so I would maybe do it once or twice a month. I'd go out there. And we would, we would rope, and I'd help them with their roping, and I would stop. I said, now, the, the key for me coming, though, is I want to be able to do a little devotional, the 10, 15-minute deal. And they said, okay, well, come to find out this guy was the, was the president of Guest Jeans. And so Ooh. he had just a – they called it uh, – Wow. The, yeah. yeah. It, it was really cool. <laughs> now I, I – okay, I, now I can now – I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay, great. And so we would stop, and what happened is every person's about a 40-mile valley uh, up there, and, 
and every person that roped in that valley ended up accepting the Lord. There was 26 of them. Wow. And so we would rope, and I'd stop and do a Bible study, and this person would get saved, that person would get saved. And after about two years into it, I knew I was going from there to Midland, Texas, to start another church. And these are non-denominational churches. And, and I was like, but there was one guy who hadn't accepted the Lord yet, and he was a Japanese ski instructor. And I've never seen a Japanese rope in Colorado. Yeah. And it was so funny. He would, and he was a Buddhist. And so he would never miss any of the rope and practices. And he didn't rope very good, but he was very passionate about it, you know. And, and uh, so I was like, Lord, what's the deal? This is the last guy who hadn't accepted the Lord. What do you want me to do? And they had a weekly rodeo in the summer in the mountains of Colorado up here. And so people would come and just flood to watch this rodeo, you know. And the Lord says, I want you to pay his entry fees and rope with this guy. Because he didn't really rope good enough to be in the rodeo. But he said, I want you to pay his fees uh, to rope in the rodeo. I was like, okay, Lord, I'll do whatever, you know. <laughs> and so I call him, and he was just, oh, Trey. I mean, he was just so pumped, you nice. know. And so sure enough, in the rodeo, he comes out there, and he ropes this steer and turns. And I'm just determined, and I rope this steer, and we win second in the rodeo. And you would have thought we won the world championship. <laughs> And so we were right out the end of the ring, and he's hugging me, and he's so excited, you know. And and I and I started talking to him, you know, do you remember the Bible studies? Do you remember the goodness of God? Do you remember? And he gave his life to the Lord at the rodeo that night. And I'll never forget, we're sitting on the side of this trailer. Mm. And it was just like all that God will do for one person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that how God had helped me the whole way just to orchestrate that guy from Japan to be there to accept the Lord in the whole process anyway. And it was like, all right, man, thank you, Lord. We completed the assignment. And um, so then I went to Midland, uh, started a church there, same deal uh, as far as the schools and the community centers and church in the park. And uh, finally got them uh, into, I think it's like a 15,000 square foot, building and stuff there built it out it used to be a furniture store and so i went in built out everything and uh the church was doing really good And at this time i was overseeing the pastor of the church in colorado the one in amarillo and i was a senior pastor of the one in midland and so i was spending a lot of time i had a little plane at that time and i'd fly back and forth and um and so during this time i just probably 10 years into it Um, of the whole thing, 2010, I just, there's a stirring that there's a big change coming and lots of change coming. And so I got before the Lord and he started talking to me about rodeoing again, traveling again. And I'm like, Lord, the guys I compete, like he didn't know. know, Lord, (laughs) the guys, yeah, let let me me tell you something. Yeah, how this works here. (laughs) I said, they haven't taken at this time, it's nine years off of competing at this level. And you're wanting me to go back and and, uh, and he started showing me glimpses of people's eternal destinies that was attached to me roping again. I have a question. Okay. When you, when you were going through the process of planning these churches and ministering uh-huh. again, how much of your, um, your natural identity had been wrapped up in that rodeo and roping world that you laid down? I mean, you gave your horses away. Yeah. That's, that, is, that is one of the most significant seeds somebody in that world can sow. Oh, yeah. So you laid down, did you feel like you laid down your whole identity yeah. to yeah. take up the cross? Yeah. And now God's bringing it back to you. Will you, will you shed some light on what that sure. was like? Well, well so if we're going to be good at anything, even ministry, business, it, it takes your focus. I mean, it takes all that you are. Um, and I remember I was at, after I won the Rookie of the Year, during this transitional process, I did have the best partners and I'm at this rope, and it's in her three times, and it's one of the biggest ropings of the year. And I woke up that morning, and I was putting God first, found Proverbs 23, and, and it says, a person driven by their desire in a negative way is like putting a knife to their throat. And I knew the Lord was telling me, Trey, if you don't get a hold of your roping, it's going to be like putting a knife to your throat. And I was like, okay, Lord. And so I went to the roping that day and I told all three partners, I said, I'm not, I didn't explain to them because they wouldn't have understood. I said, I'm not roping. And I made myself sit there and watch the roping that day. And it broke something in me that from that day forward, roping was no longer my God. Roping was no longer controlling me, but I was going to be a steward of, of what God had given me. Um, and, and so 
that was a that was a a, a, a big deal as far as just the process of that. Um, and so when I laid the roping down, it was like my Isaacs, you know, that I had believed God to be at the top of the game. I'd believed God to win the rookie of the year um, as a big accomplishment, but it was laying everything I knew down and saying, God, if if this is what you have, then if I ever do it again, you'll, you'll resurrect mm-hmm. it. I, but I just want to please you. I just want to know you. And, and I learned so much during that time of where my, where my confidence was, you know, where my faith was, um, because rodeo and you don't have the sponsors, you don't have the different things. I mean, God has to show up. I mean, when I was first starting, I remember I was learning, God, you supply all my needs. And I was learning about tithing and sowing seed. And, and I remember I was in the middle of Wyoming in the middle of the night, I was completely out of money. And I was up in another rodeo the next morning and it's like two o'clock in the morning or so, and I pull into this truck stop in Wyoming, and I'm walking around out of diesel, out of money, and I'm declaring God's word underneath my breath. And it's like either live or die, mm-hmm. you know. And I remember this guy walking up to me says, "Sir, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I just I'm supposed to give you this money." And he didn't hear what I he did had he didn't had no idea. Yeah. And he gave me the money, and it gave me enough money to get to the next rodeo and. Somehow God showed up because I'm still here. Yeah. You know, but I right, just yeah. remember, I right. just remember like I was learning how the word works. Right. I was learning about the faithfulness of God um, because doing what we do now, it, it costs so much. And in the natural, you know, we don't have to, to do what God's telling us to do, but we know that God's word works. Yeah. Right. We know, and that's what was so, I don't know if it was fun, but it was good in the beginning stages when Heather would be like, we're doing what? You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, but to see where she's at now, knowing that if God is telling us to do it, even if we don't have it in the natural, if yeah. we'll step, right, it will be there. Right, it, it has to come. He, I mean, Matthew six thirty three is all these things will be added to yeah. you when you seek God first. So he knew that was part of you, you, the design of who we made you to be. It's why you were so successful at it. Yeah, at the start, you had such favor on your life from the beginning in the rodeo world. Yeah. And so when I when the Lord started talking to me about traveling and ministering and rodeo and stuff again, while well, I'm overseeing these three churches and there's a lot of moving parts here, well, I go to the leadership team and they don't know rodeo, you know, and I just say, hey, this is what I feel like God's telling me. And they says, Trey, we don't know how this is all going to work, but we feel like you're hearing God too. And so we spent the next six months getting the churches in place for me to step out. Um, but during that time... Uh, horses started coming back to me and like I was doing a funeral one day and I get done and I'm at the house at night my phone rings and this guy says was you doing this funeral today the Lord I have this horse that I'm just supposed to give to you another guy from Arizona calls like a couple of weeks later and says Trey it's on I have this horse four years old Bella um (laughs) uh, she's four years old she's very green she's been rode but she's bred really good and I just feel like I'm supposed to give her to you and so the, the it started coming mm-hmm. coming back, you know, when it was the right time. And so during this time, um, we're getting stuff together. The lady I was married to at the time and my kids, um, I knew that, you know, Lord is telling me to travel and minister again, rodeo again. And so I moved them back to Amarillo to be close to her family uh, because I was going to be gone quite a bit. Well, during this time, she had wanted to go back to school. Uh, she ended up having an affair and stuff on me during that time. And so I'd been traveling and stuff six, eight months. Um, and I was going to do a roping clinic in, uh, Graham, Texas from Amarillo. And I was, and on the way there, this, uh, lady sends a text to me, Isaiah forty one ten, And it says, fear not for I'm with you. Do not lose focus for I'm your God. I will help you. I'll strengthen you. I'll uphold you with my victorious right hand. And so I'm thinking, oh, okay, that's a great scripture, Lord, you know. <laughs> well, another guy from totally other part of the country texts me the same scripture. Fear not, for I'm with you. Do not lose focus, for I am your God. I will help you. I'll strengthen you. I'll uphold you in my victorious right I'm like, okay, like Lord. God was trying to tell you yeah. something. <laughs> and, and so I'm like, okay, Lord. And so I get to this roping clinic, and I'm helping this person, you know, with the roping and everything. And a guy rides up behind me on his horse and he gets off and just leaves his horse there where his rope falls off on the ground behind me. And I didn't know it. And I step backwards and I step into his loop. Well, the horse spooks and takes off running with my leg in the rope. 
boom. I mean, you could just sound like a shotgun just my, just blows my knee up. And this horse is dragging me at a full run down the arena. And I just yell, angels, you do your job. And that horse just stops in the middle of the arena. And the rope just comes. Because I've seen people die like that. The horse gets to run and drag on yeah. their head or hit the pop or whatever and, you know, kill them. And so, angels, you do your job. And this horse just stops. And the rope just comes uncold from off the saddle horn. Well, I'm, so my knee's blown out. I'm thinking, okay, Lord, will I get home? And that's when the lady I was married to at the time tells me she wants a divorce. Um, oh, and my gosh. So like, I'm remembering, okay, fear not. Yeah. Do not lose yeah. focus. Yeah. For I'm your God. I'll help you. I'll strengthen you. Um, and later a book comes out of that. I wrote this little book on focus, and that's where it came out of. Was, But during this time, I'm like, okay, okay Lord. And and I even you know, told her, I said, I, you know, I'll forgive the, you know, affair, all this, and I'd done some good, I'd done good on real estate. She goes on living the life that she had chosen to live, and I have nothing. You know, the money had been moved. I, I didn't have stable income, so I couldn't fight for the kids because I go from, so when I was rodeo on the first time, I'd got to where I was making six figures, and then when I laid my rope and down, I went from six figures to making 30000 and then I went from making six, to making nothing, no partners, no sponsors, nothing. Um, but I knew what God had told me. And so then I'm thinking, I go home, my knee's blown out. Okay, I have no money. Okay, my, my wife had an affair on me and everything. And I'm in a, I'm living in a barn, a friend of mine's barn. And I'm thinking, okay, God, you know, what does my life look like? And, of course, then good religious people would come tell me, you'll never preach again, you know, you'll <laughs> never. You know, who needs the devil when you got good religious people around you? You know, it's a... And, People and, always have an opinion don't oh, they, they, about they what do. God's doing in your life. And I was reading in 1 Samuel 30 where David was doing what God had told him to do, and he came back, and he, you know, his wife was gone, kids were gone, everything he had was gone, and he says, Lord, you know, he, he began to see, God, what do you want me to do? And the Lord mm-hmm. said, pursue, you know, recover all. And so during that time, I, I began to realize that God's plan for me hadn't changed you know, he said, just because people have changed, my plan for you hadn't changed. My call for your life has not changed. And I was like, okay, well, what? how do I do this? You know, and so he said, you got a mind. What are you going to do with it? You got a heart. What are you going to do with it? You got a mouth. What are you going to do with it? And I just began to build myself back up. You know, I would go and I'd get Rocky movies and just to get I mean, me stirred <laughs> up. And I would use that and I'd begin to declare the word with every punch that you know, Rocky hit on the Russian or whatever. I'd just be get, declaring the word, letting the devil know, he you ain't stopping me. I will do everything I'm created to do. I'll That's go everywhere I'm called to do. Such a masculine thing yeah, to do. Yeah, it really it is. is. I mean, I've seen Rocky before, but I had never. <laughs> time. It's your to, source of inspiration. Yeah. Right there. I mean, running up <laughs> the stairs going. looks cool. Yeah. But, oh my goodness. Sorry, it, it, I didn't yeah, mean to interrupt, but that was funny. hilarious. It, it is funny how... God will just use certain things. Yeah. Like, that. like, And then one night, because I'm in this barn, I'm rebuilding my life. Uh, well, then you, you see this finger's kind of headed that way. Uh, I get in this <laughs> barn and I'm practicing roping. And I just, I knew the Lord says, you need to change rope on the inside. I'm like, ah, I can do one more steer with it. You know, I ignored it. Well, I come around the rope, the steer, and the rope just sucks around my hand. And I, I look down, and this finger's completely laid over like this. And I'm like, well, that's not good. So I grab it. I try to stick it back on, you know. It wasn't completely off, but I just think. to stick it back on. You okay. know, I, so I tried to pull it, you know, see if it was dislocated, and it would just fall over like that. I'm like, oh, crud, I'm going to have to go to the doctor, you know. And so I went over there, and they had to put rods and stuff through it. And, and so here I am. I just had the knee deal, rebuilding oh my, my life, gosh. this and like this. And But the whole time he's saying, fear not. For I'm with right. you. Do not lose focus. For I am your God. I'll help you. I'll strengthen you. I'll hold you my victorious right hand. And so I just started to rebuild my life and just mm-hmm. continue to trust God. And then this door. And, and I took a couple of years to, I didn't date. I didn't, I mean, because I needed to be healed right. myself because I knew that God had a wife for me. I knew that wasn't the rest of my life. And um, so I just... I, I needed to get healed. So right. during this time, it had been a couple of years and I'm in Midland, Texas and I'm driving by Mardell's Christian Bookstore, and I was at, in the bookstore, and I was looking at the relationship books and everything, and there was this one book I was thumbing through, and it was the guy who founded eHarmony, and his how he's saying his dad was a pastor, and all the scriptures that his dad founded eHarmony on, all these strengths of how they do it, and I'm thinking, because I was kind of, that was always odd to me, the online dating thing, sure. was, that was yeah, odd to me bizarre. and everything. And so I was like, oh, and so as I read it, and it was just like, 
I study people's strengths all the time when I was building the churches and building the teams and wanted to have the right people in the right place. And well, why wouldn't I do the same thing as far as my relationship? So even though it was odd, I didn't tell anybody, um, but I felt released to sign up for, for eHarmony. And that's where Heather and I met. And ta-da, yeah, ta-da. Ta-da. <laughs> and, and I'm not, I'm not being a spokesperson for me. That's just our story. Sure. And, and so, um, when we met, well, my, I'd moved to Burleson because to get close right. to my kids. Well, as we're talking, come to find out that's where she lives. And so we talked for a couple of weeks on the phone and everything just because I was very right. cautious and, you know, um, but then as we talked, we went on our first date. I was just like, oh, she's so beautiful, you know. And, and You had him right at the first yeah, date. I mean, yeah, she had she me, you know. And uh, uh, But then you heard her story earlier right. where after our second date, uh, you know, both of us were pretty infatuated with each other. And I was like, okay, Lord, help me remove the physical, you know, the physical side of things. What does she look like spiritually? What does she look like in her right. soul? And I started letting her know. I said, I'm not playing with this. This is this right. is my destiny. This is my calling. This is where I'm going. This is who I'm called and created to be. And I need to know where you stand. Are you okay with this? Don't give me lip service. I really need to know, you know, this is serious to me. And then when I sought the Lord and how the Lord saw her and, you know, within six months we're married. And uh, and it's just been, talk about restoration. Right. You know, and like she said earlier, it's been it's been hard. It's been difficult, uh, but it is. We're we're at a really good place now. I mean, it's great. There's still battles that we've got to overcome, and uh, but now we're getting you know just with the different TV outreaches and stuff. We've been right. reaching about 500 million people uh, a week through the different. But we're restructuring some things, but we're still reaching millions and millions of people, and we're getting to do it together. You know, That's we, fantastic. It, it really is. You know, last month we was at a Assemblies of God Church in Oklahoma uh, and did a revival there together. And then we was just in uh, Arkansas at, a, you know, a Baptist thing and doing a revival up there together. And it, and it's just mm-hmm. fun to get to do that together. And we went to Minister's Conference, was a non-denominational deal, just getting right. to do things together uh, and expand the kingdom and, and right. creating that environment in our home. And just going after God together. There's there's a lot to be said about two healthy people who have walked through stuff and laid their life down and how God makes a you know, can bring them into a covenant relationship and really impact the kingdom of God. Five hundred million is astronomical, the number of people you're reaching on TV. What is it like for you to be uh, in this covenant relationship in this marriage now? Yeah, it's it's a lot of work. Um, well, it is. Marriage is hard. I guess people, true. they have true. an idea that marriage in the beginning, I think, oh, you, you think you're in, you're in love and it's a feeling, but love isn't a feeling. Love is a choice and choosing to stay, choosing not to walk away, choosing to battle mm-hmm. together and not against each other and choosing to grow together and become one because becoming one is not easy. Um, and then the blended familyness, and then the added pressure of the ministry. And mm-hmm. we're not just um, a patty cake ministry. Like we, I feel like we plow ground a lot of the places oh, sure. we, we go, especially going into these denominational places. Like we're stretching them. So um, the marriage part has not been easy. And I remember the first year of marriage, we had our, we were on our little dinner date or whatever, and he's like well, we made it a year. And I'm like, yeah, yay, go us or whatever. And he's like, I promise it's going to get better. And I'm thinking, my gosh, has it been that bad? It, I mean, it was, it, I mean, I'm sure I made it the roughest, but just, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, Trey was like major league and I'm T-ball. And then you try to put the two together as far as ministry and life and mm-hmm. just the growing process. Um, it's fun. I, even though it's the hardest thing I've ever done, like parenting is hard too, but marriage and ministry and just all of it, it's it's hard. Um, there's been times where we've, you know, had the heated fellowship moments or whatever. and the <laughs> Heated fellowship yeah, moments. Intense I don't fellowship. Use that. I intense. Love that. intense fellowship. Whatever, yeah. I always say it wrong, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I hated work. But God's always showed me because, you know, I'm, although we don't throw around the word divorce, that's one thing, like, I'm not playing with that. Like, sure. I'm not, because my parents are divorced three times, both of them. Right. Like, I'm not doing that. I'm not playing with that. And him coming and out of, yeah. him coming out of a divorce, and that wasn't his goal to begin with. Like, I'm not playing with divorce. So that's not something that we play around with. However, 
there are those moments in your mind when you're in those fights and you're like, well, I'll just leave. And then the Lord got a hold of me very strongly and said, you will not fulfill your, your destiny, your calling, you, anything I've called you to without Trey. Trey is mean. And so it was like, okay, I guess I won't play with that thought anymore. <laughs> and like, cause he was very stern about it, but he needed to be well, very for, stern about it because yeah. just you give an enemy an open door like that with those stupid thoughts and don't shut them down. Yeah. And so, I mean, I love my husband. I'm thankful for him. I mean, he definitely is my Boaz and restoration in my life in every area, you know, cause I had never been married, but just the divorce on my whole mom's side and my mom and my dad and just, you guys have both seen broken. Oh gosh. And yes. God has brought the restoration. One of the I really believe that one of the anointings on Heritage of Faith is it's a house of restoration. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the people that come, yeah. there is incredible amount. I mean, God just does a work. Mm-hmm. I mean, even I mean, talk about our senior pastors, you talk yes. about everybody. Yeah. There's just been an incredible there's an anointing on the house. So I wanna know how how your story intersects with heritage. You tell the story because yeah. it's well, your story. When I <laughs> moved over to Burleson, I drove by and I saw this church and I was just thinking, okay, I know I'm supposed to go there. I don't really know why at some point in time. Well, then I met Heather and kind of that's where she went to church. And so I was like, okay, well, and I've been, like I said, ever since I've gotten saved, Dr. Savelle has just been a voice of value in my life. You know, he's mm-hmm. um, always ministered to me. So when I was moving this close, there was no question that I was this is going to be my church, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, because it was so funny. When I first got into the ministry, I did a wedding here, and Dr. Savelle's um, office was at the other end, down there, like where you come in, and it had, uh, he was getting ready for the wedding, and it had his nameplate on the front of his desk, and of course, I was hoping nobody was around. I looked around, I was like, you got to take my picture, and so I sat behind, (laughs) you know, (laughs) I sat behind the, and I've told Dr. Savelle this before, you know. I sat behind the deal there, and they took my picture. You know, He's I was all thinking, cheesed. Yeah, I was like, oh, like, my hero in the faith, you know. <laughs> so sweet. And so when I moved to Burleson, it was no question to me, but I also knew there was a step here that I was supposed to go. I didn't know what God was doing, and then that's where Heather went. Right. And then after we'd gone a few times, and I knew what God showed me about her, she was mm-hmm. going to be my wife, and I was like, okay, we're not playing with this. You know, we're mm-hmm. we're going over here, and then once we went here, Heather was like, oh my gosh, she'd never heard teaching like this, that God wants us to win. He right. wants us to grow. He wants us to have a victorious life. And and so that's, and we met Pastor Justin and Annette mm-hmm. through that. And now they're some of our closest friends, you know, as far as they're, they're warriors with us right. and they get in the trenches with us. And they're a voice mm-hmm. that we call when we're battling and struggling and, you know, yeah. and, and of course, even when we're on the road, we still listen to the teachings that are mm-hmm. taking place from here because it's it's our home. Right. right. You know, it's, there's so much spiritual strength, so much spiritual value, and just the anointing. Even when we get up to ministry, I mean, we're drawing on yeah. the anointings. Mm-hmm. No matter where we're at, mm-hmm. we put a demand on our covenant relationship oh, yeah. with, you know, this ministry. And uh, so it's very important to us. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's quite a it's quite a legacy here. Mm-hmm. And and I agree with you, the anointing is is the draw for people yeah. because the word is preached at such a, and, and it's not like an elitist term, but a, a very real, this is like people walk through stuff and God has brought us through and yeah. let's celebrate what God's doing. Um, when I think about heritage of faith and, uh, I remember one of your, I don't know if it was your first service, but I remember I was over in the youth building and y'all came over and you, and we were doing two services at the time. And I remember you kneeled down in front of your son and being like, we really feel like we're supposed to stay for the second service. And I was like, oh, that's sweet. Like, God's really moving. Whoever this cowboy is, yeah. God's really moving <laughs> in his life. And he's going to stay for two services. And we were we were totally in, you know, we were in there for both services. So I just remember this tender. That was my very first memory of you. Oh, that's and, cool. And so, um, but one of, the, one of the things that is, you know, plastered around the house, it's written on, and I'm sure on your heart and my heart mm-hmm. is, um, and you mentioned it with Dr. Seville about being a winner and having a winning attitude, but um, kind of the logo is making winners in life. Yeah. And when I sit here and, and Andy and I sit here and we hear your stories, you guys are winners in life. But what is that? What does that statement mean to you? Do you want to go first? You can go. Uh, well, it's who we are. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't think loose. You know, I especially right now in the world, and that's one of my assignments, is you make winners and warriors. You make winners and warriors. You know, we're not, 
when we minister, I minister from that mindset that, okay, what does God want us to know? What does he want us to do? How do we apply the word? How do we get the victory? How do we live from a place of victory? Mm-hmm. Knowing we already really have the victory, but how do we get it from the unseen to the seen? So making winners in life, it just echoes. We're not playing church. We're not being religious. You know, how, God, I need you now. How do I get you to show up? Um, and so in everything that I do, I'm always asking my purpose in life is I want people to know God and be the best them they can be. So whether I'm at a rodeo or doing a roping clinic, because mm-hmm. it will lead hundreds of people to the Lord, just teaching them how to rope this year. Right. Um, you know, whether I'm doing a, a leadership deal, I did one early this morning. I'll fly to California this next week. I'll do a lot with John Maxwell, I'm an executive right. director. Uh, you know, I went to the Dominican Republic uh, not too long ago, we're praying about it. We're supposed to go with them to Brazil and Panama and Paraguay this year and teach leadership to governments, the country's government. And it's just like, okay, if I'm going, I want is this going to help people know God and help them be the best them they can be? And so everything that we do, ministry, leadership, roping, that's something we're asking. Because if, if we're in the process of knowing God and we're being the best us we can be, we're going to win. We are going to win in life. We're going to think win. We're going to believe win. We're going to talk win. We're going to live win. We're going to, yeah, there's going to be some battles, but we win. Mm -hmm. And it's a mindset um, that this being a part, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're here Mm -hmm. is because when you, because I, when I gave my life to the Lord, I always knew there was more to God than just getting saved. I knew there was more than just going to church. I knew there was more than just singing songs. I knew there was more, and and the reason we know there's more and we want more is because there is more. And and to follow Miss Carolyn, Dr. Savelle, Pastor Justin, that that live it out in front of us and have blazed the trail, um, and that it's real, and that we can live that life here on earth, not just when we get to heaven, you know, but but the here and now. So uh, winter in life, I mean, that's the way we think. That's who we are. It's what we breathe. And... uh, incredible yeah this is one of my favorite parts because we, uh, we ask this question ever at the end of every episode oh, so cool. it's very neat to hear the diversity of the answers uh-huh. but also they always end up tying into like a don't quit never give up yeah. Yeah. keep going kind of thing so anyway i didn't mean to set you up for that answer but <laughs> you can answer yeah. however you want no okay um i was gonna just how do you follow that like <laughs> i mean that encompasses us <laughs> To a T, but for me specifically, I guess my assignment specifically is to clean up people's thinking. Like, I don't know if you know this, but Heather is a flowering plant that grows over in Europe on the mountainsides, and they take it and they make brooms with it. They twine it together and they make brooms with it. And the Lord's like, part of your assignment is to clean up people's thinking, teach them how to fight and tell them who I, like what I've done for you, I'll do for them if they'll seek me. Uh, But just to pour that warrior mentality into them. And so that's what I do, that there's no quitting. There's no backing off. I mean, if you'll continue to fight and seek God, um, he'll show up and he'll prove himself faithful and real to you. And so. It's a fantastic answer. Yeah. It's very good. (laughs) Thanks. Well, we just want to say thank you again for taking time. I know you guys have an incredible schedule that you keep that God keeps you on (laughs) and keeps you moving forward and obviously family and all the things. So it it really is an honor to to be able to get some of your time. Um, it's a seed you're sowing into our church body. It's Um, a privilege. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you again for listening. Again, this was part two of a really incredible conversation with Heather and Trey Johnson. Um, We are just so blessed by the time that we got to spend with them. And if you missed part one, I want you to go back because Heather really dives into her story and how God restored her life. It's, it really is a beautiful story of how God brought them together. So linked in the show notes, we'll have their website as well as some of our favorite messages from Trey and Heather Johnson. We're so glad you joined us again. We have another episode dropping on Friday. So tune in again for another winning conversation.